Last week, after the savior of all that is civil and decent called a reporter a stupid son of a bitch, one of the recurring media defenses rushed to his aid was sure that moment may have lacked decorum, but it was nothing compared to the man at the podium prior who frequently referred to the press as the enemy of the people. This was simply impoliteness, but that... That was nearly the end of our free society. And sure, I'd like not to be enemies, and in a functioning society, I agree the press and the people aren't. In fact, the function of the press for the people is vital. To search constantly for the truth and to challenge those in power to provide it. But just like any non-enemy friendly relationship in your personal life, that friendliness depends on baseline agreement on values and a baseline respect for them. Just like I won't call my neighbor my friend if he brings his dog over to take a crap on my lawn or if he burglarizes my house, I won't call the press my friend by default either, even if there is theoretical benefit to that relationship in its ideal form. That friendship has to have a foundation. It has to be earned. It has to be maintained. It has to be respected. It is not given by default. And it certainly isn't preserved when it's abused by the other party to it. In other words, if you don't want to be called an enemy, stop acting so enemy-y. Stop attacking the rights of the people and start attacking the power centers that threaten them, because that's exactly what every censorship push, including the current one, is. It's not just an attack on the target of the censorship, the speaker. It is also an attack on your rights as a listener, and that is crucial to understand. Where there's a push to oust Joe Rogan, the current target of choice, that is just one piece in a broader campaign to control what you are able to listen to and how you are able to make up your own mind. So our reaction as a public to such abuses shouldn't be to evaluate whether we personally like Joe Rogan or not. It should be to protect our right to make that decision for ourselves. In that respect, whether you like Joe Rogan or hate him, an attack on Joe is an attack on you. They admit it, and it should be understood as such. That reality was demonstrated undeniably in a segment on CBS News Morning Program on Monday, a segment presented as criticism of Joe and embrace of the calls to punish him. But if you listen closely, you will hear the attacks on you, the listener, for tuning in and for deciding for yourself. And of course, it starts with poisoning the well with simple character assassination, which is appropriate considering that's all their favorite term misinformation is anymore. It's just a fancy insult. It's a fashionable name to call, but it holds no more reason value than calling Joe a stupid son of a bitch, for example, because it's never actually explained with reason. Challenging and debunking misinformation would be Joe said quote X, but here's information why that refutes claim X, which they never do. And even if they could show that Joe is wrong, which they can't and they don't, is it possible that he's just wrong, but honestly so? As in wrong, but open to the better information if you actually bothered to provide it instead of just smearing him? These people demand the benefit of the enemy doubt for themselves in the name of decency and civility. But it's awfully glaring how that same grace isn't extended to Joe. But of course, they do none of that, and instead, the term misinformation is just used as an empty smear. Joe is misinformation, and Joe's guests are misinformation too. These doctors and nurses are on the front lines. They're dying. You don't turn your back on them for power or money. You stand with them. Nils Lofgren, the guitarist in Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band, and who also tours with Neil Young, joined him and Joni Mitchell by removing his music from Spotify over misinformation on Rogan's show. I'm not trying to promote misinformation. I'm not trying to be controversial. But his show, a Spotify exclusive and the number one podcast on the platform, has spread misinformation, including claims that the drug Iver is an effective treatment for COVID and that microchips are in vaccines. Last month, he spoke with two doctors known for promoting vaccine falsehoods. Number one, what were those specific claims? Who made them and why are they wrong? Because I notice there's no quote or clip presented, just your characterization of what some unnamed person said, but it was certainly false. How? Show us. Number two, those are not claims made by the doctors that you showed. You just lumped everybody together to imply that they are, but they aren't. And number three, even if those claims are suspect, 
Why should I believe a bunch of geriatric has-beens who lost their minds on acid trips decades ago instead? Just to recap, this widely published cardiologist is not credible on cardiology or any general medical topics. This virologist, who helped develop the vaccine technology at issue, is not credible on virology or any general medical topics. But this guy, who once played in a band that your mom listened to and now looks like the hearse driver for his own decades dead music career, he is very qualified. And this other guy who also had a high profile 30 years ago when he said, you should be careful if your gay grocery clerk handles your food because you might get AIDS, he is also of esteemed medical credentials. And they're not just the unlikely experts on your health, they are also the unlikely experts on free speech, of which they are big fans. Because actually, this isn't about censorship at all. It's not about any censorship. We're all for free speech. We just don't want to be associated with um, misinformation and lies that are killing Americans. When I had a conversation with Nils yesterday, he's very clear. He believes in the First Amendment. He believes that Joe Rogan and anybody else has a First Amendment right to say whatever they want. He says he doesn't want his music his artistry associated with the platform that would allow Mr. Does he say okay. Right, he loves free speech. He just doesn't want to associate with a platform that would host it on account of, you know, his disdain for it. Now, even if you want to be sympathetic with the association claim, which I generally am in most contexts, what exactly is the association here? Spotify is just a platform for music and for speech. That's all. Am I associated with Hitler because there are Hitler videos on YouTube? Is MSNBC associated with Fox because both come in your cable package? Is Neil Young associated with Kanye because music from both is available in the Apple Music Store? And actually, they probably should collab because it turns out they have a lot of thematic overlap. The one attempt that this news piece makes at showing any information of substance is one graph showing hospitalization rates between vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And somehow this one graph supposedly shows that Joe Rogan is indeed misinformation. Let me just share with our viewers some of the actual numbers. The CDC says unvaccinated adults are 68 more times at risk of dying than fully vaccinated and boosted adults. Check these out. Hospitalization rates for the unvaccinated. That number shoots up as high as 90 people for every 100,000. Mm. So those are the numbers. So Rogan, those are the facts. Those are the facts. And, and I just want to point Yeah, take that, Joe. Those are the facts. Sure. Did Joe dispute them? Did Joe say those numbers are false? Did Joe say that graph is a lie? Or are we just dunking on a fake Joe that we made up? Regardless, let's consider those facts more thoroughly. This chart is hospitalizations, not deaths. If you're unvaccinated, your risk of hospitalization at the height, the peak of the spike, which is now declining, was 90 out of 100,000, 0.09%. And again, that is for hospital admission, not for death. An even smaller percentage will die. In other words, there's a better than 99.9% .9 chance all you unvaccinated scumbags are going to be just fine. You have a similar risk of being hit by a Ford Escape of Peace if you live in Waukesha. Six deaths, 62 injuries out of a population of 72,000. You have a similar risk of being murdered in Baltimore or St. Louis, roughly 60 per 100,000. But I noticed these threats to public health never get quite the same enthusiastic or fearful news coverage. Anyway, this panel of esteemed not enemies of the people then convenes to discuss all the ways in which they support your rights. But see, you may have free speech rights, but you don't have a right to Spotify. You have a First Amendment right to say what you want. You don't have a First Amendment right to appear on a platform as large as Spotify. That's the issue. Yeah, unless you're Joe Rogan, in which case you not only have a free speech right to say whatever the hell you want, but you have a contractual right to say it on Spotify. It is you guys who have no right to any of it, not just to what Joe says as a matter of free speech, but to Spotify as a matter of contractual property. You'll notice he acts like this is some sort of legal technicality. Oh, sure, you may have a First Amendment right, but you don't have a property right. Number one, he's wrong. But number two, this argument betrays the value of free speech as a philosophy. Why did we enshrine speech 
with legal protection. We did that because the open exchange of ideas produces competition, and through competition, the truth emerges. But he doesn't believe in that concept either. Joe Rogan is correct that the medical world gets stuff wrong, but True. there's a process by which the medical world corrects itself, and that process is not interviewing guys on the fringe of the medical world on your massive platform. That's called irresponsible. It's not yeah. censorship. Right. Editors are not censors, they're ensuring quality. First of all, Spotify is not an editor in this arrangement. They are legally a platform, not a publisher. They do not control the quality of the content or the lack of it. They merely host neutrally. Second, define fringe. To Joe's point in response, it was bannable fringe to say that the virus came from a lab. It was bannable fringe to say cloth masks are ineffective. It was bannable fringe to say the vaccinated still carry and still transmit the virus, and all of those things have since been acknowledged as true. But most importantly, protecting the expression of the fringe is exactly the process for finding the truth. The whole point of the First Amendment and free speech as a philosophy is that even if only one kook believes it, it still should be protected and it still should be expressed so that the ideas can compete and the truth can emerge. It was once fringe and anti-science to believe that the earth is round. It was once fringe and anti-science to believe that the earth revolves around the sun. You can bet there are similar pieces of absolute nonsense widely believed right now, and the only way to move beyond those misunderstandings is to protect one guy's right to challenge them. The process to arrive at the truth is not to make speech a special privilege reserved for the elite who all repeat the same point points to each other. That is the process to live in lies in perpetuity. Besides, is Joe's show really that fringe if tens of millions of people listen to it? That's an odd inconsistency in the argument here. Oh, that's just fringe lunacy. But also, it's a big problem that so many people listen to it and believe it. Certainly, way more people than listen to this segment itself. The other problem, too, is people say, well, just turn it off. You don't have to listen to it. The thing is, a lot of people do listen to it, and they're getting false incorrect information. And that's why it seems so dangerous. And it matters. Huge reach. He has a huge reach. This is what I was referencing at the start. It's not enough for them or for these people who don't like Joe or his guests simply not to listen to it themselves. They have to influence or control your ability to listen to it as well. So while it's worth defending Joe's rights for their own sake, make no mistake, it is your rights that they're after. Your right to listen and decide for yourself. And if they deem that your assessment is wrong, well, your right to make that assessment must be reduced or revoked. The last flail at any sensible reasoning here before they break is the most hilarious. Yes, free speech, but this isn't the acceptable sort of speech. This is a special kind. This is life or death speech. He just says he's having a conversation. And it, that's what Joe Rogan will say. Yeah, but it's, a, li a, it's a life or death issue. That's why it's yes. in a special category. Glad it's not an opinion so about space or something. Yeah, it was one of those lesser known moments at the founding. Weird opinions about like space and stuff are fine, but no life or death issues, quote James Madison, introducing the Bill of Rights, 1789. Almost everything can be characterized as a life or death issue. Every seemingly small decision that you make will have influence on how your life develops and when it ends. Your choice to go get the mail could be a life or death issue if you get hit by a car walking to the mailbox. But even if you wanna argue that some issues are more fundamentally fatal than others, fine. Do I not have a free speech right to say that smoking is cool? Do I not have a free speech right to say that seatbelts are for losers? Does Neil Young not have a free speech right to publicly wonder if you can get AIDS from a contaminated potato? Also, opinions about like space or something are in fact a life or death issue if you're building a ship to go to space or if you're already in space on Apollo 13. The point is, these are all life or death issues, and they are not actually in any sort of special category, legally or philosophically. They are just viewpoints. And like any viewpoint, you can say that it's dumb or it's wrong, and you can argue against it, and you can convince people that it's bad, but you do not get to ban it and violate the rights of other people to try to make it disappear, and you certainly don't erase any truth it may hold by doing so. And the end of that segment reveals 
they do not accept that arrangement. They do not accept a scenario where they get to present information and they get to tell you what they think, but ultimately the right to decide what's correct is yours. As we started with, this is not about Joe Rogan or his guests. They're just the fashionable scapegoats of the week. This is about disdain for you and disdain for you believing what you want to believe until you believe what they want you to believe. You will not be left alone. If you don't respect a person's right to his own thoughts and can't allow him to form them and to hold them himself, you don't respect anything about that person. There's a reason that fundamental right was protected first. And I don't necessarily want to be enemies, but if we can't respect that first principle about each other, the right to our own minds, then we don't respect each other as people let alone friends. And so if those are the terms that you guys have the right and the ownership to what goes on in here, I'm sorry, but I have to decline. You've given me no choice. Under those circumstances, I guess we're going to have to be enemies. By your design, not mine, I really do hate to be so strict and unforgiving, but I'm sure you'll understand because after all, this is a life or death issue. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Minds that is at M L Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.